If you could buff some Rosticons Rumble cards, which ones would you buff? I have some ideas. Hey, buddy, watch this. That's right, folks. We already saw some buffs to cards from the Boomsday Project and the Rise of the Mech event. And if we follow suit sequentially, maybe we'll see some buffs to Rosticons Rumble at some point after Savers of Old Doom has been released. And I think it's important to do that because Rosticons Rumble has historically been one of the weakest expansions in Hearthstone that I can certainly remember. Maybe the Grand Tournament ranked below it, but there just haven't been a lot of impactful cards, just a handful that are influencing the meta today and some buffs could certainly help fix that. Now, I do want to note that I'm not just going to be tweaking mana costs in this video. That's obviously what Blizzard normally does, but I think there are some far more creative ways to make cards impactful that doesn't lose the spirit or soul of the card, but just makes it a more intriguing option. I also want to note that I didn't just go for class cards this time around. I'm not following the exact model of Boomsday Project. I just picked eight cards I think could be changed in some pretty interesting ways. That said, let's jump into them. Up first here, I have Princess Talanji for Priest, a card which unfortunately isn't seeing much play today, but a really easy change to her text here could make her far more valuable, I think, and that is that she could summon copies of minions in your hand, not just summon the minions from your hand. So right now, if you get four or five things that are uh, not from your deck in hand, Talanji will pull them from your hand to the board. So you lose those assets, you lose those resources. So although she's a big tempo play, if your opponent has something like a Twisting Nether or a Brawl, you just dump all those cards and your opponent removes them all in one fell swoop and you haven't gotten anything out of it. But if Talanji instead summoned copies of those minions, you'd retain those resources, you'd be able to reload a little bit stronger and she wouldn't be nearly as risky of a card to play. And I think that would clearly make her far more impactful. And, you know, it'd be a little bit scary to make this card like seven or six mana. I don't think that buff would really do the trick, but this one would keep her that late game threat that doesn't hit too early and doesn't just high roll the game immediately, but she still retains some longer term value than you might expect. Otherwise, shifting her from a purely tempo driven card to a little bit more of a value card, a change that would really work for the class for Priest and probably get this card over the hump. So up next here is the one boring buff of this video. I didn't change anything about Hyreek except his mana cost. This is the only one I thought that this was a suitable fix. But for Hyreek in particular, I think it's fine. And it's hard to change this card in a lot of other ways. You could, for instance, like make it two twos instead of one ones. But at eight mana, that still doesn't feel all that compelling. It still just seems risky. And it's like worse than the forest aid, for instance, or a little better immediately, but worse without the twin spell aspect, right? So six mana for me with Hyreek sounds and feels a lot better because it gets it closer to that like Whispering Woods territory where the one ones might be valuable enough on turn six. That wouldn't be a great play but it might be more acceptable than a bunch of eight mana one ones alternatively if you get this thing to two two three three four four by that range it's a very very powerful play but it's not likely that you're going to get to that like six six range for high reek by turn six that's just going to be difficult to do so it's never a completely overwhelming board influence or at least very very rarely so i think this hits a little bit more of a sweet spot from a mana standpoint where it can be more threatening as that 2-2 or 3-3 stat line without being completely overwhelming, whereas at 8 mana, it just feels far too slow. Is this card risky at this cost? Maybe. It could be pretty powerful in the exact right deck to support it, but remember, it's a one of Legendary, so if your deck is built specifically around Hyreek, there's a pretty high chance that that plan will backfire, you'll top deck your high reek, and it will still be a pretty average play a vast majority of the time. So I think this helps make high reek feel better without feeling oppressive. Moving on here to Gurubashi Offering. This is a pretty intriguing change. Right now, Gurubashi Offering, uh, it just dies. And you get eight armor out of it, and you know, eight armor for one mana doesn't feel super awesome in Hearthstone these days. Theoretically, it's better than some other options. But if you don't play it immediately on turn one, anytime later in the game, your opponent usually just kills it, and you've wasted a card in your deck, a draw, and a resource for nothing. Now, the new Guribashi offering doesn't necessarily change that aspect. It's still got a very high-risk situation because this is now a 
two mana card that has the same health total, of course, but it's always happening at the start of your turn, not just a one-time thing. So the risk remains the same, but the upside, the long-term upside of this card becomes much, much higher because if you can keep it alive, if your opponent can't answer it, then it really starts to snowball into a ton of health. So instead of maybe getting eight health once, this card suddenly becomes, okay, maybe I get eight health, or maybe I get 16 or 24, and it's like, oh my god, that's pretty darn exciting. Now, I didn't think that was healthy on turn one, so I did bump this up to two mana to make it feel a bit like a Doomsayer. Now, you'll say, gosh, Reza, sometimes your opponent can kill Doomsayers. Your Gurubashi offering will never survive. And I think... You're right, in a lot of cases this will still just die. It is out of ping range, importantly, so it can't just be pushed down by a hero power from your opponent. But any kind of early game threat will just push through this immediately. And that means you have to support this card a little bit. Maybe you hide it behind some taunts, right? Like this plus mirror image, for instance. It might actually survive and give you some armor. I don't think this is inher inherently a good card now or a powerful card, but it at least gives you the option to support it and play around with it, and it gives you a chance to make it relevant, which is really the important thing. This feels like a card that I would want to build a deck around and want to try to make it work. It might still fail, but it'd be super fun. The current version of Gurubashi Offering doesn't provide that experience, and that's why I think this would be a far cooler design. So moving on here, we have the Arcanosaur for Mage. Currently, this card deals three damage to all other minions, including friendly minions, but I've updated it here. Same cost, but now it only affects enemy minions. So it's a much swingier sort of board clear. And yes, this does feel a little bit like Reno the Relicologist that just got revealed in Savers of Old Doom, but it's a different kind of removal and a different kind of synergy, so I think it's still unique enough in that it's an elemental card, not a no-duplicate card, so it would still be a fun way to take a look at this card. And it also makes it distinct from Duskbreaker. One of the problems with Arcanosaur is it looked like this situational Duskbreaker, the old card for Priest. And of course, Duskbreaker was an incredibly powerful tool. Arcanosaur just looked kind of weak and weird in comparison. This gives it the unique spin that it no longer affects your own stuff. So suddenly it seems like it's still probably not amazing because it's just six mana and it's elemental synergies. Uh, those are two challenges for the card to overcome, but nonetheless, it has that opportunity to be at least a swingy style card instead of a higher risk card, which I think brings the balance closer towards reality, closer towards playability. Maybe it doesn't get it all the way there, but again, this is a spin on the card that makes you see a reason to play it and makes it feel good enough to try, and that's an important distinction. So moving on here to Soul Warden, I've got an interesting change that I think will give you a little bit more influence and control over the kinds of value that it generates, a trend that thankfully we've seen a little bit already in Saviors of Old Doom with Expired Merchant. But for my change here, instead of three random cards, I think it should discard, or excuse me, return the last three cards that you discarded. So in other words, you get to choose when to play this. So, uh, you know, if you discard five things throughout the course of the game and two of them are good and three suck, playing a Soul Warden today, you could get the three terrible things back that you don't need. But if you know when you discarded things, like, oh man, I discarded um, my most powerful asset. I discarded Archvillain Rafam as my second discard. I need to be sure to play Soul Warden before my fourth discard, or I might risk losing that Rafam. But if I play it at the right time, I can guarantee that I'll get that Rafam back. And giving you that influence and power over your decisions and being able to do things in a calculated way removes a lot of the randomness from discard, which is really the problem, right? Is losing stuff that you need. Once you get that influence back and you can make smart decisions, calculated decisions, Soul Warden becomes a really interesting resource and asset generator, which is what Discard Warlock needs, and I think a trend that Blizzard is finally moving towards. So this version to me just rewards the player more. It makes it less unfun right now. It can be pretty disastrous with Discard. This makes you feel like it's not as big of a problem. You have uh, some power at the end of the day, and that's exactly what I want to see to make Discard Warlock work. Up next here, I have a version of Stolen Steel, uh, mostly the same, but it has a cost fixing, cost reduction, cost increase in some cases. 
of setting the weapon that you discover to three mana. And I like that because it makes this an on-curve play. So right now when you play Stolen Steel for Rogue, the problem is you're disrupting your own weapon on turn two when you'd normally hero power for a weapon, and you're kind of stuck without a weapon, and maybe the only good one's a five mana weapon, and you're like, ugh, this isn't going to work out at all, and you feel like you've kind of wasted some mana, wasted some time. But if you can guarantee an on-curve play, suddenly it helps make your deck far more consistent. And then, of course, there are also some really big upsides when you're discovering a five or six mana weapon, and it suddenly only costs three. So you can get, like, a Doomhammer for three mana, or an Arcanite Reaper for three mana. And there are some really intriguing options to get a powerful play out of your Stolen Seal. So you're bypassing two mana now for a potential, you know, two, three, four mana discount in the future. So you can regain some of the tempo lost with your stolen steel while also still generating some another class synergies for a burgle rogue style deck now of course this can also backfire you could get three one mana weapons or a couple two mana weapons and not get that high roll opportunity so there are still some checks on the power level of this and the consistency of this it's not always going to high roll into something nuts but often you could get a four or five mana weapon at a discount which will help you move into the game at a faster rate. Now this still doesn't work very well with Spectral Cutlass, so there are some inherent anti-synergies with this card and Burgle Rogue builds that run that one, although many of these days don't. So I think this would help this become a viable alternative for, you know, either a weapon-based deck or a Burgle Rogue deck that, you know, runs tests and just wants like really big weapons equipped. It just gives you more options to play it, it makes it a little more fun, gives you some upside, which is what a bad card like this needs. So moving on here to Surrender to Madness. Currently, a uh, card that's not being played at all. People have tried to make it work a ton, and it just doesn't get there. The plus two, plus two buff is just far too delayed to make any sense, right? You give it to minions in your deck, you gotta draw those minions, and you gotta play those minions. There's just like two or three turn delay before you really have any influence, and you're paying the penalty of this mana uh, cost the entire time. So you get this huge downside, and it takes forever to realize the upside. But what if instead... Surrender to Madness gave you immediate upside by introducing an aura effect to the board, kind of like what we saw with the Quest Rogue reward back in the day, whereas instead of setting everything to 4-4, everything just gets plus 2, plus 2. So if you play this with minions already on the board, it kind of functions as like a Savage Roar that can add 2 additional damage, or I guess a couple Blessing of the Ancients to be specific. So you get that immediate onboard impact, which is nice. Also, minions in your hand will benefit from it as soon as they're play it and then minions from your deck that you draw will also benefit so it basically moves that buff from being restricted to the deck only to always impacting the game both immediately and even in your hand now this could go kind of a half step not as far by just affecting minions in your hand and deck that would help a little i took it all the way there by going ahead and just affecting everything that you have on the board for the rest of the game which i think that long-term upside is nice so even minions you like summon or generate from thought steals or whatever will also get the buff because you're paying such a long-term penalty with this mana sacrifice and to me that means this card gets way more playable is it actually too good at that point maybe it could be this might actually be a little bit op maybe you could pull the buff down to one one it's one of those things i feel like i'd need to see in action but at least it fixes the core problem with the card if you think you could rebalance this one better maybe make it five mana and destroy five of your mana crystals share that thought in the comment below i don't know if this is perfect but i like the direction that it's moving in balance could be fine-tuned at a later date by you guys and then finally here, I have one last card, the Ironhide Direhorn for Druid, and it's a pretty simple change here. I think the minions summoned from its overkill effect should get Rush, because this is a pretty slow card. It's delayed. You kind of got to play it out there, hope that it can attack. And I think if you're paying that penalty and tempo and you're not able to influence the game immediately, then the reward for this card certainly should help make up that gap. So you sacrifice a little bit of immediate influence to gain some immediate influence later by summoning these big five fives with rush. Because right now, Ironhide Direhorn, it's slow, it sits there. Even if it does kill something, which is super unlikely, the thing that it summons is slow and it sits there and you just never get anywhere. This fix makes this card far more impactful right out of the gate 
Now, I will admit with something like Bees, this is a little bit more intriguing of a card, although I still think that's more of a sneaky combo than an actually good one. So maybe this would be unnecessary if that somehow did work. I don't think it will. So this fix would really solve the problem for Iron Dye, Ironhide Direhorn for me. And there you go. Those are my eight fixes for Rosticon's Rumble cards. There are far more bad cards than that in Rosticon's Rumble that could be changed. But these are the ones where I saw some changes that uh, were more than just mana tweaks, right? There are some ways to, to change these cards uh, that make them more interesting, that make them more fun, and in many cases make them probably more healthy for the game as well. And I'm curious if you guys have any other changes you'd like to see in that vein where it goes beyond just a mana buff share the cards you'd like to see buffed and how you'd buff them of course in the comments below but until then thank you so very much for watching and until next time game on